Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, and in particular also to the KCC for having organized this event. Also, thanks, uh, big thanks, of course, to Wild Cube as well for having organized this uh, fantastic exhibition that there's been so much interest in. So, thank you. Um, as you heard, uh, initially, in fact, my brief was 25 minutes. Um, I really tried hard to cram it in. Um, it will be three minutes longer. So, um, in the interest of speed, I will uh, read out my paper. And um, <clears throat> now, the KCC asked me to give a talk that places the emergence and significance of Tansekwa within a broader socio-political context. Now, the question of emergence is a challenging one, especially as artists, including those involved with Tansekwa, tend to produce works not only in response to their present, but also their past. It leaves the question of how far in the past do we need to go in order to understand the contexts of Tansekwa. Uh, in many respects, the rising interest in abstract art starts in 1945 in post-colonial Korea, when Korean artists strove to establish a new visual language that reflected a new and modern Korea um, solid by its colonial past. <laughs> um, now, for many, this meant a rejection of the figurative styles of painting that had been in vogue during the colonial period, and that had been the primary style of painting for oil painters, as well as Nihonga painters, who worked mineral colors on silk or paper, examples of which you see here. And both works are very well-known uh, works of art that came into the fore, as I said, during the colonial era. However, the Korean War put a temporary stop to the debates on the future state of Korean art. Yet paintings that have survived from the war years reflect a rise in individual experimentation of styles, textures, and techniques. Among them are several works by the oil painter Kim Hwangi, who is widely regarded as a pioneer of non-figurative art, having produced Cubist paintings in Japan where he studied uh, around the time of the 1930s, also during the colonial era. During the Korean War, Kim Hwangi's interest in non-figurative forms of art continued, as reflected in this oil painting from 1951, of an anonymous mass of refugees cramped together in train carriages. Other artists who were interested in advocating a new realism were Chang Jin, whose work you see here, as well as Yi Jun So. They had all studied in Japan, where they had been experimenting with various styles and techniques without committing to anyone in particular. And here's the work by Yi Jun So. In 1947, they formed the so-called New Realism Group, which marks the beginnings of a concerted local interest in promoting abstract art, or perhaps rather non-figurative forms of art. The artists became well known for their individualist and engaging treatments of mostly Korean subject matters. Now, during the war, the city of Busan, that you see down there on the southeastern coast of Korea, replaced Seoul as a center of arts and culture. Among the thousands of Koreans who fled to Busan during this time were also artists, some of whom supported themselves by painting portraits for US military personnel, such as Park Seung, whom you see um, on the um, in action, so to speak. And Park Seung is also a well, very well-known um, Korean artist who actually also became drawn to predominantly Cubist traditions. During the war years, several exhibitions were held at venues in Busan. Some were financially supported by the United States Information Service, or for short, USIS. And I think it's worth mentioning here that the USIS had considerable impact on the rise of abstract art in Korea, not least since abstract art signified American values of freedom of speech, thought, and action. From this perspective, the presence of the USIS in Korea formed part of America's Cold War policies as culture, information, and economic, uh, academic exchange became significant means of reorientating foreign subjects, including 
the South Koreans. Two months before the signing of the Armistice Agreement of July 27, 1953, that ended the fighting between the two Koreas, but it essentially left the country at war, the USIS distributed $5,000 worth of supplies to the new realism group when it held its third exhibition in Busan. Participating artists included previously mentioned abstract painters such as Kim Hangi, Chang Jin, Lee Jun Sok, as well as Pek Yong Su, whose work you see here. And this painting may have been among the eight works that were exhibited at that particular time. It's really interesting for me that the exhibition generated considerable interest among Americans, and a review of it was published in the New York Times under the heading, Cubism is Blended in New Korean Art. Aimed at garnering support for the American intervention in Korea, the article highlighted that the end of the colonial rule meant, and I quote, a new freedom for Korean artists. And the article claimed that many artists based in Busan had escaped from the North, having become, and I quote, tired of painting portraits of Stalin and North Korean Premier Kim Il-sung. In reality, however, I should say there's no evidence of that. Um, but a similar message of the horrors experienced by artists in communist North Korea was presented in the South Korean press. In 1952, Pictorial Korea, which was an illustrated magazine published in English by the International Publicity League of Korea, printed this two-page caricature of North Korean society. The first frame depicts a despondent-looking artist, flanked by a musician and a writer. Under the watchful eye of a menacing policeman, the artist appears to have completed a portrait of Kim Il-sung and Stalin, um, as the uh, Hangul script uh, indicates. Titled Art for Stalin, Kim Il-sung Say, the caricature points fingers at a society where artists must sacrifice freedom of speech for survival and may only produce paintings that support <coughs> state ideology. The American support for and promotion of abstract art as a signifier of American and, in particular, anti-communist values continued into the late 1950s when the USIS organized exhibitions of influential American abstract artists, including Morris Graves, Mark Toby, and Jackson Pollock. And um, the exhibition was mentioned in Shin Misul, which was a, um, the only arts journal published in South Korea at this particular time. Shin Misul means new art. Um, and it perhaps is also worth mentioning the um, rather poor quality of the um, illustrations, these rather murky black and white um, illustrations. But nevertheless, each page would contain kind of a very brief summary of each of the artists that were exhibited. However, at the same time, when it comes to information about these artists, the USIS libraries that were located throughout South Korea also held copies of Time and Life magazine, several of which ran large illustrated articles on prominent American painters. And oftentimes, Korean artists tore out the illustrations and hung them on the walls in their studios. American action painting, abstract expressionism, had considerable impact on Korean artists in the late 1950s, as Park Sabo also noted in several interviews. However, America was not the only channel of information for artists. Korean artists were also impacted by contemporary Japanese artists' interest in abstraction. And it's worth noting that Korean artists did not attempt to emulate or favor one type of abstract art over the other. Rather, it seems that they so-called indiscriminately picked up abstraction from a range of different sources, as Park Sobo noted in an interview in 1961. In Japan, avant-garde artists who in, the late, uh, who in the mid and late 1950s were involved in the good time movement, such as Shimamoto Shozo and Murakami Makiko, as you see here, the good time movement was led by Jiro Yoshihara, 
And Gutai Art has become known for their abstract paintings as well as exper experimental performances and kinetic art. Yoshihara challenged Gutai members to, um, to discard traditional artistic practices and to seek not only fresh means of expression, but the origins of artistic creation itself. Among them was Katsuo Shiraga, um, who was here performing challenging mud by wrestling in a pile of mud at the first Kutai art exhibition in Tokyo in 1955. Now, the relevance of Kutai lies in the fact that the group became closely associated with the French artist Michel Tapier when he visited Japan in 1957. Michel Tapier's seminal work, uh, Nar Otra, a volume that was influential in establishing the aims and developments of the art and female movement in France, was translated into Japanese in 1956 and published in the Japanese art magazine Mizue. A few years later, in 1958, Paxabo read the Japanese translation. Park became uh, an influential spokesperson for Art Informel through his involvement with the Contemporary Artist Association, um, for short it's called Mika, which was a progressive artist group that was formed around this particular time. <clears throat> When the Mika held its third exhibition in 1958, several of the entries were celebrated as Korean interpretations of art in Formel. And I do have to obviously apologize for the very poor quality of the images, but this is um, all that is um, available. But, and here, um, on the left-hand side of the journal is the discussion of that exhibition and you can see with images of some of the works that were um, included. And in particular, seven works by Park Sabo drew much attention. Not only did they carry a visual likeness to informal painting by European artists, the post-war conditions under which they were made were argued to mirror those of post-war Europe. The critic Yi Kang Sang wrote that Park Sabo arrived at the world of informal from a wilderness of despair. News of the exhibition was published in Shinmisu, and on the adjacent side is a brief discussion of informal art, along with very murky pictures of the artist, George Mathieu, a key figure of the post-war um, art scene in Paris. And you see here a photograph of, again, him in action in his studio and one of his works of art. Now, irrespective of whether Micha artists share the same aesthetics and methods of application as French and female artists, many seem to have found resonance in the post-war social and political conditions of which art in female rose. Pax for example, would often mention how the um, hardships suffered by the post-war Korean artists led to unique expressions and particular artistic impulses. And it's worth noting that around this particular time, in the late 1950s, when media of artists turned to informel, South Korea had a gross national product on par with many developing countries in Africa. For Park, the, the emotional impact of the war and its two million casualties found an outlet in the application of paint, which he compared to the shrieks of a single cry of death. Park's common signals how artists' methods of executing artworks became increasingly significant from the late 1950s onwards, as painters began to concentrate on the art of painting itself, unimpeded by anything save the decision to paint. The influential critic's E. Il's interpretation of Kim jong jus painting is a case in point, as E. Il felt they embodied a so-called ingredient of action, he referred to Kim jong jus work as a so-called art of detonation, in that it manifested the artist's tension when so-called colliding with the materials. He saw in Kim's paintings a temporal reference to the very moment when the brush met with the paper. Particularly important were the fast movements Kim employed when working. For Yi, 
This speed was both temporaneous as well as sensuous. During the 1960s, Informel became part of the established government-supported art scene. It led to a larger number of abstract paintings being accepted for the National Art Exhibition, which was a very influential government-run exhibition. By 1963, nearly half of the oil painting submissions were abstract, and over the course of the 1960s, also ink painters and calligraphers, such as Sosayov, who's very well known, began to experiment with um, <clears throat> these new styles and compositions. Now, the official acceptance of abstract art <coughs> by significant institutions in South Korea, such as the National Art Exhibition, coincided with the establishment of Park chung hees military government in 1961 and its strive for modernization, industrialization, and urbanization. Demands by abstract painters for change and the criticisms of earlier power structures matched the military administration's agenda to revise outmoded political systems from the colonial and post-war eras. Informel became a metaphor for a new, modern Korea that coincided with Park chung hees visions for the new generation and the country's future. However, by the mid-1960s, Informel lost its edge and had um, what many saw um, or had become stagnant, this being a term that many uh, used. Instead, leading abstract painters uh, such as Park Sobo and Ha Chung Hyun briefly developed an interest in geometric abstraction before turning to complete abstraction in works that were later, later categorized as Tan Se Kwa. Now, the term Tan Se Kwa stands in Korean for monochrome painting. In a Korean context, it refers to monochromatic paintings in gray, brown, beige, and white hues that emerged in the late 1960s and in the following decade came to dominate the Korean art scene. However, Tan Se Kwa was not an organized movement and the artists who came to be classified under this rubric did not share a specific agenda. Rather, it was a term that was, that was applied retrospectively to a particular type of painting that manifested a merger between the artist's body and mind through his exploration of the physicality of the painting materials. Thus, the significance of Tan Se Kwa lies in the artist's approach to the act of painting, in that it challenged earlier productions of art. For many, Tan Se Kwa signaled the rise of a new type of painting that was not only contemporary, but also indigenous to local traditions and philosophy. The term came into frequent use in the mid-1970s when critics attempted to identify a local form of art that was uniquely Korean and by implication different from Japanese and Western styles of art. By then, Tan Se Kwa had become an important fixture on the Korean art scene and was also promoted in Japan in exhibitions such as the Five Korean Artists, Five Kinds of White in 1975, and the one you see here, Korea, facet of contemporary Korean art that was exhibited in 1977. And do, of course, know, uh, for example, Yu Fan's paintings on the back wall. <clears throat> now, in uh, Joan Key's words, Tan Se Kwan was not about the mastery of technique, the transmission of meaning, or even the manipulation of materials. Rather, the artist's interest in the dematerialization of materials and the focus on the coexistence of subject and matter led to a so-called phenomena of encounters approach to art that for many was seen as not only new but also uniquely Korean. The methods employed by Tan Se Kwa artists were diverse. They soaked the canvas, pushed paint across the surface, ripped paper, and in various other ways pushed the boundaries of what was traditionally considered a so-called painting. Um, ha chong Hyun, for example, applied a thick layer on the reverse side of the canvas and pressed it 
until it penetrated to the other side. As you can see here, you can just see how the bits of paint are kind of seeping through the weaves of the canvas. And after that, he would repeat this process from the front of the canvas. It led to a series of works that Hart called Conjunction, which he began to work on in the mid-1970s. During the early 1970s, Hart preferred to leave the paint on the front side in the state in which it emerged, as you can see here. However, over time, he began to mark the front side of the canvas with various tools, including his own hands. In this particular painting here, he used a flat tool to push and scrape the paint back to the reverse side of the painting. The methods employed by Tantikwa painters came to be associated with traditional East Asian philosophy as framed by Korean conditions. A case in point are the reactions, are the, the reactions to Yun Hyung Hoon's a distinctive umber blue series that he began to produce from the early 1970s. Yun blended a palette of umber and ultramarine pigments with turpentine and built up layer upon layer of paint over several weeks or months. Each layer of paint seeped into the canvas or hemp at different rates, resulting in gradations of color and blurred edges. In this way, the finished work became a manifestation of the encounter between different materials and not a conscious manipulation of them. In a review published in Tonga Ilpo of Yun's fourth solo exhibition in Seoul in December 1975, it was stated that Yun's approach reflected East Asian so-called spirituality, uh, and emptiness, in that it went beyond all senses and emotions. These qualities encourage critics to single out Tan Sekwang as different from Western monochrome art. The reference to a particular East Asian sensibility was reiterated in artists' discussions of their methods, and especially Park Sebo was vocal on this point and detailed in many statements his reasons for using plain colors and repetition. In the late 1960s, he began to produce his Ecriture series that consisted of fine lines repeatedly drawn by a pencil on a canvas covered in white paint. To make the work, he laid the canvas on the floor underneath the wooden support, and on the support, Park placed a plank, enabling him to sit poised above the canvas. As he drew pencil lines in a repetitive motion, the plank would vibrate, sending reverberations back through the pencil and onto the canvas in what the artist saw as a non-action approach to painting. In 1973, he detailed this process as follows. I painted nothing. My work had no form, no emphasis, no ins and outs, except for the pure vibration coming out of not doing anything, an action through non-action. I feel in reciprocate the resistance of the bouncy canvas, then I feel replete with an impulsive sensation. In this way, I keep being gravitated into the canvas. It is similar to cultivating a religious spirit. I started from where there was no form, no image, where it was impossible to express. Like other Tantikwa artists, Park's practice centered on repetition. That he found this analogous to citing a sutra or meditating served to link his practice to East Asian cultural and religious traditions. He also made references to East Asian philosophy, especially the writings of Lao Tzu, the premier thinker of Taoism. Lao Tzu's philosophical teachings were well known in Korea, including his favorite theme of the disparity between intention and result, as advocated through the principle of mui, often translated as non-action. Associated with this was the notion of being empty. For Lao Tzu, such as con a condition was accomplished by being without, mu all the usual possessions of conventional society. Instead, Lao Tzu directed attention to natural action, i.e. a movie action that called on a state on unselfconsciousness. 
Echoing Lao Tzu's teachings on non-attachment and purity of mind, Pabsabu explained that, it's not that I'm against the world of expression, rather I believe the act of expression, expressing an image, has a certain agenda or goal, and that there's no pureness in that activity. So the reason why I emphasize going beyond the image or beyond expression is because I want to live in the activity itself with no intention of that activity. I want to enjoy a feeling of liberation in practicing pure Muwi. Park's reference to Taoist philosophy of non-action echoed the refusal of making that formed the core tenets of the Monoha movement in Japan. Monoha was a movement that emerged in Tokyo in 1968 and included among its members Seki no Nobuo, as well as the Japanese, um, no, as well as the Japan-based Korean artist Yi Huan. Korean artists were familiar with Monoha works, not least through Yi Huan's writings, several of which were published in Korean journals. And moreover, Pak Sebo was a close friend of Yi Huan and in the 1970s, they frequently met. Monoha artists denied the notion that the artist creates the work, suggesting instead that the work is led by natural processes or materials. By negating the subjective agency and thereby artistic creation, Yiu Fan called for a new artist who was not a maker, but an enabler of encounters. In his three-dimensional relating work, this was manifested through his use of stones, mirrors, and steel plates. Materials with distinctively different characteristics that call for the viewer to contemplate the relationship between the materials. The turn towards the perceptual conditions of the object itself was in Japan brought out of social conditions inherent to Japanese post-war society. Like other avant-garde artists in Japan, those involved in the Monoha movement grappled with how to articulate loss of destruction and defeat amidst rapid industrial growth and economic prosperity. Artists explored seeing and articulated the actual and virtual realms of perception. However, in Korea in 1960s and 70s, the question was not so much how to see something, but rather how not to express what you saw. The rise of Tan Se Kwan coincided with Park Chung hees increasingly authoritarian rule, culminating in his suspension of the constitution of the Third Republic. In its place, he put the Yushin constitution that gave an autonomous power to the president. When, in 1974, emergency decrees were implemented, any criticism of the Constitution and the President were made a punishable offence. This included any actions, writings and songs and artwork that were deemed to be anti-government. Activities that were interpreted as being pro-communist were also outlawed. These arbitrary and dictatorial laws were enforced by the KCIA, the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, more often than not through repressive and violent tactics. It made the production of art a precarious, if not an outright dangerous act. It may have been these conditions that encouraged a return to the very basics of painting, i.e. the material. As Tan Sequa artists minimized their involvement in the so-called fabrication of work, by surrendering to the materials, they made their role as makers and beggars. So, within this cultural and political environment, how are we to understand Tan Sequa? Perhaps these uh, points, these words by Yu Fan, would perhaps give us some insights, and this would be my concluding points. The emergence of Tan Sequa is, and I quote, um, from Yi Yufan, interlocked with the social situation at the time. It was the time when everyone's life had frozen in extreme poverty. It was the era of abstraction. This was the background of the monochrome, with the destitute minimality 
in impoverished life on one hand and the oppressive military government on the other, the monochrome was an ideal fit. Thank you very much. My talk is going to be more of a personal account of the journey of my first encounter with um, Down Sequa artists, actually, and also with, um, well, specifically with Park Sequa's uh, paintings. This is um, an installation um, shot from this beautiful exhibition that was um, curated and organized by the Kutcher Gallery in Seoul, and also um, a Belgian foundation called the Bokossian Foundation in Venice at a place called the Palazzo Contarini. Um, and there was a Liu Fan solo exhibition downstairs, which was exquisite. Everything looks exquisite in uh, Venetian palaces, of course, but um, his work was particularly mystical and um, stunning. And upstairs, there was this revelatory exhibition of works primarily from the 1970s by the, I would say, the key players in what's come to be known as the Dance of Bar movement. Um, and the first paintings I encountered were those of Park Sebo. Um, and I was completely bowled over by this um, group of paintings that I couldn't believe we hadn't seen before in the West, really. Um, of course, there, there had, in fact, been um, some movement in New York and Los Angeles, not in the UK, but um, with other commercial galleries, Bloom and Poe in Los Angeles, and um, um, busy finding other avenues and sort of two-pronged attacks and finding other people to go in and, and um, do a bit of positive lobbying on my behalf, um, I suddenly got this email in my inbox and said, Dear Mrs. Costell, we are very embarrassed to say that your email has been stuck in our spam folder for <laughs> one month. And of course, we'd be delighted to see you in the studio, etc. So at that point, I thought, well, I'm not going to hang about. I think I'd better just get on the plane and go there. Um, uh, I would say that the artist is um, quite, well, he's a very proud person. Um, <laughs> by the time I got there, I think the entire world knew that I was that, that he was doing a show at White Cube, and we, we hadn't even really exchanged two words. So I, I was very pleased with myself that I'd um, actually gone as quickly as I did um, and just sealed the deal, as it were. But um, we did have conversations to and fro about the content of the exhibition, because like most artists, of course, he, wants to show, he wanted to show initially what the work he was making now, um, which is a very understandable instinct. Um, but from my perspective, I felt that as his work had never been seen in the UK before, and in, indeed hardly seen in Europe, actually. Um, and people were not at all aware of the work. Well, they, if they were, they were just starting to become aware. And it was very much a sort of market thing. A few dealers were interested in it and sniffing around, etc. But there wasn't, um, there wasn't a kind of groundswell of critical interest um, from the European or American side at that point. Um, and it all, it's all happened very quickly. I mean, it's happened in the last less than two years, I would say, this um, explosion of interest in, the, in um, his practice and also those of, that of his, um, his peers. Um, so I felt very strongly that we wanted to start at the beginning, as it were, when he found his artistic voice and he talks a lot. I'm just going to whiz through these because they're all kind of, yeah, having big discussions about what we can include and what we can't include. But um, we did eventually agree that we would do a historic show, so starting in the 60s, um, and the paintings in the exhibition run, the latest works are from 1981, um, but the majority of them come from the 1970s. Um, because I wanted it to be a coherent space, I had limited space to play with, so I couldn't give him a retrospective, and I didn't want to do a copycat show of something he'd recently done in Paris with another gallery, um, which is recent paintings with a couple of early works thrown in. Um, I didn't think that really made sense. Um, so he very kindly agreed, and he was extremely generous with the works that he gave us for the exhibition. As you can see me plotting the show, looking very skeptical. Um, <laughs> getting down to business. Um, and this is the end result. I'm rather hoping that I have, oh, I don't have enough installation shots, but there's one little painting which 
the, the grid painting there that you see is from 1969, and there's a smaller um, version of it, which is sort of almost like a prototype from 1967, and he talks about this um, sort of eureka moment that he had with his young son. He was watching him um, as part of his homework, I suppose, to train the muscles in the hand for calligraphy, uh, to fill in these little squares on the exercise book. Um, and uh, being very, getting increasingly frustrated that he couldn't do it, sort of scribbling outside of the square. And he describes this moment as the moment when he realized he wanted to make um, drawings, or he wanted to make surfaces rather than um, more formal um, paintings, or some of the more formal paintings that we saw in um, Charlotte's talk. Um, I don't know how, uh, it's, it was extremely hard for me during the time that I spent with him to get any concrete answers to any of my questions, um, because I really wanted to understand exactly the, the, the process at which, because it was such a, it's, it's, it seemed to me from what I could um, gather of his early practice, it seemed to me that it was quite a bold fast, that there was a big shift suddenly, um, and it's possible that he did have a sort of um, awakening of some kind. I don't know, you probably know more than I. But um, uh, that was the earliest painting in the exhibition, and then, um, as I said, the, there's a kind of natural progression. It's not hung strictly chronologically, um, because there didn't seem to be much point in that, but um, the gestures vary a little bit. But what was interesting to me um, was that it was very apparent that he doesn't work with, um, as most artists would, they wouldn't put a grid on the um, canvas, even in pencil, from which to work. And the lines are perfectly level, regardless of the, gest the size of the, jet the, of the mark that he's making. So sometimes they're big loops, sometimes they're very small loops, Sometimes they're overlapping many times, um, and it's obviously done in still wet oil. And sometimes the canvas is primed, and sometimes it's not, and the effect is different each time. But what was very striking to me in terms of the process was that um, he uh, doesn't use any kind of guidelines underneath, which is phenomenal. And I was speaking to um, a Korean friend who was like, "Oh, that's nothing. New. You in the West, you also your knowledge is so." specific and specialized. If you want to make a building, you have to have a structural engineer to do this, and then the architect does this, and then everybody, every, everyone's knowledge is very narrow and very specialized. If we in Korea, we have a, we have a, you know, we have a master builder. We want to build a, a Buddhist temple. We have a master builder, and we do it. We start in the middle, and we have no drawings. And <laughs> I was thinking, how fantastic. And then what happens if you get, you know, you start building a palace, and you realize you've made a major, mistake on the third floor. But anyway, uh, it was very interesting because we did talk a lot about that. Of the, we, I asked him a lot about artists that he, um, or Western artists, I, I wanted to understand how aware he was of them because there wasn't really any uh, real restriction on um, his access to uh, images of the work of Sai Tong Li or Agnes Martin or any of the others that I've mentioned. Um, but he said that he elected to turn his back on um, what was going on in the rest of the world and make these what um, are really very introspective paintings. And it's more, the actual making of them is more a process of um, meditation somehow. And he talks a lot about the cathartic process of painting um, and particularly making these, uh, this series. Um, and that he, it, it, it Basically, it was a form of healing for him. But as Charlotte was describing, also a very physical process. He talked about kind of standing and bouncing while he was making the work, and that was one of the ways that he um, reached this kind of other state of sort of emptying the mind. Um, so that's kind of, that was very interesting to me that he um, had visited Dia Beacon um, in upstate New York twice. And that was where he encountered the work of Agnes Martin. He said the first time he was very moved by it, and the second time it didn't do anything for him at all. And um, so, and a lot of artists were written off as sort of, um, I suppose, I think we're all just too spiritually corrupt. I think that's the main problem, is that we're, that in his mind, a lot of um, 
I mean, I say that lightly, that was meant to be a joke, but, um, you know, I, I don't mean that to be taken literally in any way, but I think that there's definitely a feeling that in the West, he looks at a lot of Western artists who were making work, similar work at the same time, and he feels there to be an absence of um, some sort of spirituality, which I don't um, mean in a religious way at all, but um, a sort of third dimension of some kind, I suppose. But it was very interesting to have those conversations with him. Um, and that is a little crowd shot of the opening, which uh, happened to open on, um, the exhibition opened on the same night as the, um, what is it called, that festival, the Light Festival? Yeah. Yeah. Not Lumiere, the Lumiere Festival, which, which shut down most of Mayfair and Piccadilly, so you could drive around. And um, it was freezing cold, like Moscow was minus two or something. 14th of January, and all these people came. And in fact, there were so many people who'd flown from all over the world to come and pay homage to um, the artists, which was very humbling. Um, and that's us outside the BBC, little and large. Um, we uh, went to the BBC <laughs> World Service to do um, uh, an interview um, for I forget now what it's called. It's um, Outlook, I think it's called, the, the arts program. But it was fantastic to do, because it's not easy doing everything via um, translators. We had a fantastic translator, but she had the misfortune to be female, so she couldn't translate for him on uh, the radio, because, of course, you need a voice match. Um, so we found this very obliging gentleman who um, teaches, um, I think, diplomats, mainly how to speak Korean. Um, so he's not strictly a translator, and he's certainly never done a radio interview, so it was quite a, um, it was an entertaining experience. But we, we, um, we got through it, and it was broadcast, and it's fantastic. So that was a, a big thing, I think, when um, you think this six months ago, nobody um, was really so aware of him, which is pretty incredible. This is him explaining um, something to, um, <laughs> No, actually, I know exactly what he was saying in that picture. There was a collector who um, had had the same um, sort of revelatory experience as I had in Venice. Um, she's called Meryl Rose, and she comes from Boston. And she heard that I was doing this show, and she was in New York at the time, and she didn't have her passport. And she called her passport and said, "You've got to text me my passport. You've got to send me my passport. I'm going to London." Bar. So then she arrived in London to see the pictures. This is about four or five months before the exhibition. And um, um, she was, because she was so speedy, she was able to acquire a work from the exhibition. And she told this story to Mr. Park, who was absolutely delighted with it, of course. And then it's already entered into myth now on Korean um, national news, I think. Um, so that's what he's doing there. And then we had um, some rather amazing visitors. We had Mrs. Ban Ki-moon and um, a group that she was traveling with come and see the exhibition, which was um, very um, nice to see that, that um, so many people were coming through of such great caliber, actually. And it's what well, has been interesting um, in the whole process of doing this exhibition is to see what the um, response, not just to the press, which has been um, very positive, um, but also the general public and other people in the art world that one encounters, um, that it's been resoundingly um, well received and people are very excited about it. So it seems to have achieved its objective. Um, that's just another, I think that's it. This is this painting at the end, by the way, is uh, one of these horizontal lines, which I think that Charlotte, you had that beautiful photograph of him um, with the vibration. I think it's my favorite painting in the show. And that's it. Um, informative in, in many different ways. Uh, my name is Su Kyung Lee. I'm, I'm the moderator of this um, just very short um, talk, I think. Um, and then I will uh, I will just ask a couple of questions to the speakers just immediately following their talks, and uh, we'll open up the question and answer session to the floor very soon. Um, 
Charlotte, I mean, Dr. Horlick's um, talk was uh, very interesting to see how a, a knowledgeable Korean art history scholar can see Park Sogo in the sort of the lineage of Korean sort of modern and contemporary art, and then looking at some sort of um, social and political context, very slightly, but quite an uh, important part of that understanding. So. Um, I'd like to just um, ask a very brief question about how you really see his um, practice of this particular period fitting into sort of the the next generation, the contemporary practice, because that you, you talked very eloquently about the the big beginning of modern history. Yes, I I followed my brief very carefully <laughs> about talking about the emergent. But you you're mm. thinking about. How contem or later what came artists, after? Yeah. What came after? That's a really good question. <laughs> that, that is a very good question for me. Um, um, I've been fascinated by the response to Tansekwa mm -hmm. art, not only Park Sobo's art, but to Tansekwa art. Um, the response that happened in the 1980s, um, the 1980s during the Minjum uprising, and where we see a completely different type of art emerge. Um, and Minjung art is um, very realist forms of art that form part of the protest movement. And um, for me, it's been very interesting to see that the very, very direct response, um, which I don't really see in later periods so much, but in particular in the 1980s, um, critics and artists involved in the Minjung movement were um, very, very critical of Tan Sekha very critical of Tansek uh, Hua artists um, in that they argued that Tansek Hua artists did not respond directly to the political situation at the time. And I think it raises very, very interesting questions in terms of what is art, why do you produce art, what should an artist do, um, and so on. So for me, that has been really interesting. Yeah, I'm sure you will follow with a lot of questions, but um, just for the sake of the kind of balance and really interesting <laughs> spectrum of time, that um, Park Sobo could be understood as a very historic figure in a way. Although he's in his 80s, he's, he's still very active. Um, he produces a lot of um, new works as well. And for you to sort of to hear to hear that. Um, Catherine, you were very interested in that particular moment of his practice. So you, you slightly mentioned why you thought that would make more sense to have the 70s as a very focused area. But for you, how, how would you sort of describe this first presentation of uh, Park Sobo's work in the UK? And what do you think it was received in a very particular context? Sorry. So the, the reception context. of, yeah. The, the way you chose that particular period, and how do you think that actually sits in the sort of more conventional maybe ways of understanding that period, let's say 70s art in an international context? Well, I mean, I think what's interesting to talk about maybe here is that at the moment there's an exhibition um, in Los Angeles at Blumen who were the first gallery, um, well, maybe the second gallery in America to show Tansikwa artists. Um, are currently staging um, an exhibition of, um, which is a sort of compare and contrast of Dansikwa artists and um, American minimalist artists, not necessarily minimalist, but I mean, Richard Serra is there, um, Sol DeWitt, um, Robert Ryman, um, Agnes Martin, all the usual suspects, and they've been juxtaposed in a very, um, I would say quite, well, it's quite a direct kind of, comparison that they're asking the spectator to draw. Um, and I think what's interesting about that, because it's been much talked about, of course, is that what you notice most um, profoundly is the extreme difference, because they're being, these were works that were made in a completely different cultural and um, political context, which were non-political works, I would say. Um, but, uh, they come from a totally different place, um, I think, intellectually. So I, I, in, in terms of this exhibition, I mean, you just throw it out there, you know, a commercial gallery is a much more entrepreneurial um, organization, and you can do these things in a relatively short period of time. We were talking before the talk, but it's, 
it took six months from the moment of seeing the work to doing the show, um, which is pretty amazing, I mean, to be able to do that. I, I would have loved to have spent more time traveling around, um, traveling in, in uh, Korea and uh, visiting all of the artists if I could have done, but um, there was a certain imperative because it was suddenly got very competitive. <laughs> and there are all these kind of um, relationships behind the scenes that one has to be aware of when you're doing a show like that. So I hope that it's, I mean, I, I know that it's had a positive response. I think mean, art historically, it's rather hard to say. I, I think at the moment, there's an awful lot of re-evaluation of artists um, who are in their 70s and 80s who have perhaps been overlooked, I mean, in the West as well, so. Um. I think it, it raises an important and very interesting question about how we can really understand the context of a very particular culture, cultural product, but also seeing it as a more of a formal um, entity, which you can only understand through the formal qualities or affinities or contradictions with what you know. And um, from sort of my personal point of view as well, uh, as, as a museum curator, with a, a, a collection which is based in the UK, but dealing with a lot of global practice mm. and, and trying to reflect what's actually happening in contemporary, but also more historic sort of terms. So I think um, this uh, question will be answered very, not lightly, I'm sure it's a lot of, rather than uh, uh, answers, I think that there are a lot of questions being raised by looking at this type of things in London at this time and um, looking at the 60s and 70s. So it's 20th century art history slightly differently. Perhaps we are talking about Raymond and Agnes Martin. These artists, probably we will see Sai Tombly slightly different if we knew more about practice like Park So Bowes. Certainly. So, I, the, so just uh, parking those questions, very loaded questions here, <laughs> and then I think um, I'm, I'm very keen to actually open up some questions from the audience, so please do raise hands and um, yeah, it's a bit dark, but I'm sure we can we can tell who's raising hands. Always the first question's hard, I know, but um, don't of, don't be afraid. I, anything really really nagging questions? Yes. When the Tessiquah artists were criticised in the 1980s for not having been politically engaged in the 70s. How did they respond to that criticism? Mm. That's a, a wonderful question. <laughs> I have not come across any response. Um, I mean, of course, apart from Park Sobo at one point um, said that um, he himself was scathing of the type of art that, uh, the style of art that actually Minjung artists did. Um, this kind of uh, very, it, it looks a bit more like socialist realist art, um, very figurative forms, <laughs> very colorful and so on. And Papsipo said, oh, anybody can learn to paint such works. It just takes practice. As long as, if you paint it enough, you'll eventually be able to do it. So for him, that was not good art. It was not a sign of being a good artist. Mm -hmm. And that I thought was really interesting because again, it goes back to what we talked about, this, um, the, the processes of doing something. And in a way, the fact that he's arguing that his method of, of producing the artworks is through essentially a non-action, right? Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, I guess, being this enabler and going through a meditative process and so on, so that he uses his mind and body. Um, and um, whereas very evidently, say, Minjung artists in the 1980s, for them, that wasn't uh, significant at all, right? So perhaps that answers your question. He did not see works of art that Minjung artists produced as good art. Um, not necessarily just Minjung artists, but that style of art as good art. Any other questions? Yeah, we'll start from there. No, Just wait for the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't think Minjung art was uh, solely um, uh, realistic art. Mm. 
Yeah, I think uh, well, while we are on the subject, maybe I'll add a bit too. Because <laughs> uh, I think the debate between Minjung and the sort of so called established art, although they were also overlooked, after all, mm -hmm. from international scenes, so there's an interesting sort of rediscovery of different things. And um, while Minjung artists were definitely dissident artists politically, and they saw art as a more of the means of addressing political issues and perhaps changing situations, actually. Um, that that um, artists like Park Sabo, who were teaching mostly in universities and probably dominating most art, artistic educations in higher education institutions. So that, that was a very established form of practice. I remember very clearly of the sort of 80s and 90s um, sort of um, exhibitions and all these like public institutions showing these artists, established artists who are very well known, well acknowledged within Korea, but perhaps lesser known outside. So this, uh, the excitement about rediscovering this um, artist, who were actually established in Korea, but overlooked internationally, had slightly different, I, I guess, a, um, a relationship with international scene. Park Sobo was very well connected internationally. Whatever he says, don't believe. <laughs> Artists always say things, you know, and they change their mind. And maybe memories are selective too. But uh, he was very well established um, sort of in the context of Paris Biennale, for instance. He was the commissioner of a lot of uh, international shows. So he was in, sort of in, in the position of deciding what was represented outside Korea as, as Korean art. So that, that, again, that sort of power structure was acknowledged within Korea. So Minjung artists were very aware of those power system within art, through art. And I think that was the, something which had to be resolved within Korea. But there wasn't really dialogue as such. I think they were always just dismissing each other, thinking, oh, that doesn't really make any sense. And they were sort of um, busy establishing their own sort of agenda and making them sort of going through whatever the system they were working in. So I, I suppose um, that is slightly still less resolved and when the sort of more left-wing government came in, in Korea in the 90s, um, these Minjung people became establishments too. And they made a lot of mistakes too. I, 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 I mean, personally I can say, just from my perspective, um, they did similar things about the power and all these things. So probably it's still ongoing kind of a criticism and perhaps it's something to think about, but definitely interesting to see how the legacies of such um, art movements like Dan Sekwa will sort of continue in that sense. <coughs> yes. Um, it's really nice to hear uh, three different point, viewpoints from museum, academic, and commercial um, well, uh, background. And I thought, well, I was sure I was doing a cultural event during the Venice Biennale at the same as at the same time as Tanzekwa, and I was really surprised to hear lots of collectors coming and ask about Tanzekwa artists. Obviously, uh, sparked by the Tanzekwa exhibition at the Venice Biennale. And I believe it was also uh, connected to the expansion of art market. You know, discovery of zero artists to um, various other post war art movements around the world. So, um, uh, I want to hear discovery of subsidiary groups such as well, uh, Tanzekwa around the world, how it impacts the museum collection as well as the private commercial um, galleries and how it affects the... I mean, it's a huge question, but <laughs> I want to hear about... Yeah, because I'm interested in how YQ took off uh, the Sobo Park mm -hmm. as the first artist and how it might impact the museum collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, I can answer the white cube part quite straightforwardly. Um, uh, I'm very fortunate that I have um, a brief to do exhibitions with artists that I think are an interesting 
um, position, or maybe haven't been seen in the UK before, um, and to introduce them to the program, um, either as one-off exhibitions or as ongoing relationships. Um, um, but they're not artists who are already obviously part of the program. Um, and so it was a really subjective uh, choice for me. Um, I just happened to fall in love with the paintings. And it's very interesting. I mean, there are so many questions we could be here all night talking about. Uh, you know, sort of the chicken or the egg that came first, you know, because of course there are um, very uh, different points of view that you see. I, I don't know how much, it's very hard to, to, to understand clearly from um, the artist himself um, exactly um, uh, where, what point of view he's coming from. Um, but I was drawn first to the painting. That's the most important point, I would say, because I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know anything about any of the other artists. And of course, the more time I spent with him, um, of course, I've become profoundly aware of his importance and his um, uh, presence as a, a sort of figurehead who's both loved and possibly loathed in equal measure, depending on who you speak to. So, um, yeah, that's that's the choice. I mean, I think from from an outside perspective, of course, it always looks calculated, or it looks as though there's some a master plan. Um, but as is very often the case in the art world, it's simply one person seeing a show, talking to another person. And then they can make it happen, and then it happens, and then it's sort of a snowball effect. So, um, in terms of what I think you're asking about prices, and obviously the market being suddenly there being this frenzied interest in in Lansaka artists and also zero artists and other movements or groups of artists that have been overlooked for many years. Um, I mean, of course, it it accelerates um, that, but the majority of of market activity in terms of new prices being set for these paintings has been happening in Asia, not in Europe or America to date. Um, and it's in Asian auction houses, particularly I mean, with dancing artists, with the Korean auction houses. So um, that's rather hard to gauge how much of that is driven by Western collectors and Western interest. Um, and of course it's playing a part. Um, but I would say it, it actually started locally which is interesting because it, this whole push has come from the Korean galleries. You know, it's a very strategic, uh, well-organized um, um, approach that they've taken, um, specifically for J, I would say. So yeah. the only other point I wanted to make about that on price, actually, vis-a-vis -vis, um, museums is that um, the prices for our show, everything I had in our exhibition, remarkably, was directly from the studio. It was what he was able to consigned to us, they didn't have to go and borrow or loan things from people, which is extremely unusual for an artist of his stature and his age that he still has so much historic work. Um, but he determined the prices. <laughs> he was very clear on that point. <laughs> so. I'm sure I have a lot, thing, a lot of things I would like to of us can say, but um, uh, the time is limited, unfortunately. But it has been very interesting just to really uh, point out these um, questions, and I think it has been very useful to really hear about the more contextual sort of um, legacies of Dan Sekwa and its sort of relations within Korean art history, but also how a one artist can be really understood as, as a very figurehead of a very particular movement of a country's art. So thank you very much for both speakers once again and thank you very much for the participation and listening. Thank you. Thank you.